Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your Tuesday afternoon with the DECL. My name is Max, and this webinar is entitled To Find DECL Artists in Conversation, the third in a series of online roundtable discussions that feature DECL's most eminent alumni in celebration of the department's 111th founding anniversary. To formally start this webinar, I'd like to call the DECL Chair, Dr. Judy Celine Ick, for our welcome remarks. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the third in the series of DECL webinars in celebration of the 111th um, founding anniversary of the Department of English and Comparative Literature in UP Diliman. Um, it's a specially exciting session today. Um, it's the third in a series uh, to let me, just let me explain a bit. I, found, I, I discovered I haven't really explained this. Um, we took inspiration from the last line of um, Alfred Lord Tennyson's poem, Ulysses. And um, uh, in, that, in that last line, um, he talks about, well, one equal temper of, um, what is it? One equal temper of heroic hearts made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. So we use that as an inspiration for this four-part webinar. The first one was called To Strive, and in it we uh, featured the creative writers and the literary luminaries who have come from the DECL, those striving to find and to write um, striving to, to write about the nation and Philippine culture. We had Gina Apostol, we had Butch Delisai, we had Jimmy Abad. In the second, called To Seek, we had our most eminent critics, um, literary and linguistic critics, Topsy Tupas, Carol Howe, Lily Rose Tope, to talk about how they were seeking questions and critical frames and ways of talking about Philippine culture um, in their work. Today, we have to find, we have our finders. We have, a, you know, again, a, a panel of distinguished alumni who have found in other arts or have found through literature a way to other arts and a way to shine their light there in film, in theater, in dance. So we're very excited to show off um, the versatility of the DECL faculty. Hindi lang kami pang books lang. You know, sometimes we step outside of books and, and, and manage to flourish elsewhere. So welcome and thank you for being here this afternoon. Like all of you, I look forward to a stimulating conversation with our speakers. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ma'am Rudy, for your welcome remarks. I'd like to introduce Professor Luis Jashio Sonido. Professor Sonido is a teacher, scholar, multimedia artist, and cultural worker with research interests in literary criticism, intellectual historiography, media and film scholarship, performance curation, and ethnographies of art production. She is based at the Department of English and Comparative Literature, UP Diliman, and is currently the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. Let us all welcome Professor Luis Jashio Sonido. Hey, Luj. Hi. <laughs> it's okay when you just broke character and then went, hey. Um, this is what I love, I think, you know, about the format of, of conversation, right? Uh, webinars do tend to be quite stiff, but uh, we like to take this opportunity, of course, to uh, reacquaint ourselves with, again, some of the uh, most imminent uh, members no, of, of our faculty and also um, uh, our most imminent alumni. Um, I am also a fan. Of, of the three uh, esteemed panelists that we have today. And I'm thrilled to be uh, in conversation with them as well. Uh, to be frank, uh, they necessitate no introduction, but I will be uh, introducing them one by one um, as before they go into you know, some uh, an individual pieces, I suppose to say, uh, about their interdisciplinary practices. Um, the prompts that we have prepared for today, and I'm sure you've read, uh, those in the audience, I'm sure have read them uh, in the publicity materials and so on, um, are uh, number one, what role does the academic field of English studies play in the pursuit of the other arts? Number two, how does one find one's way to another art through literature? And number three, what are the issues, especially on the part of the audience in the consumption of art 
that is largely created, written, produced, marketed in English. So these are all million dollar questions. They're very broad questions. And um, we'll see where our conversation goes, uh, depending on where our panelists and our audiences also want to take us. So um, the structure will, is quite straightforward. We'll just, uh, I'll introduce each speaker uh, one by one. Um, each will initially present a, a thought piece on, on these prompts. And then from there, we can have a, an open forum. And we, of course, invite um, audiences to comment in the chat box. Even if you don't use the Q&A, if you want to just comment and react, um, we like comments and reactions from our audiences. Um, but of course, uh, if you do have questions to ask, please feel free to, to write them in the Q&A, even as the, the discussions are happening, even as the speakers are still speaking, and then we'll get to them um, at the end of the program. Yeah. All right, uh, that said, we'll go straight to our first uh, guest. Um, please uh, let me read from uh, her biographical note. Um, our first speaker is Ms. Myra Beltran. Myra Beltran's pioneering work is considered to be instrumental in the formation of an independent contemporary dance community in the Philippines. She first trained in classical ballet under Vela Damian. Prior to her work as an independent artist, Myra worked with professional companies in Germany, the Ballet of Oldenburg in Yugoslavia, Ballet of the Theater of Pristina, the Ballet Philippines of the Cultural Center of the Philippines, and for Enrico Labayan's The Lab Project Phil, originating the major roles in his repertoire. In 1994, she started her work as an independent choreographer and brought together artists collectively working as the group Dance Forum. Beltran opened her studio as an alternative performing space in 1997 and created the blueprint for the formation and flourishing of independent contemporary dance in the Philippines. Creating a body of work that stretched the possibilities of dance in the Philippines in both aesthetics and manner of creating and producing dances. She holds a unique place in the Philippine dance community because she has accomplished this almost single-handedly. Her solo repertoire is the most expensive, extensive sorry, in the Philippines, a career path that has paved the way for other dance artists as well. She holds a master's degree in comparative literature from the University of the Philippines and, cur and currently co-curates the CCP choreogra choreographer series, which nurtures and showcases choreographers working in the medium of contemporary dance. Let's welcome Ms. Myra Beltran. So yeah, good afternoon, everyone. I mean, it's such an honor to be uh, here, you know, with the other artists. So, and the topic is how to find one's way to another art through literature. But in fact, it's re the reverse for me. If one were to talk about formal studies here at the Department of English and Comparative Literature. Um, but I have to say my mom was, was an MA graduate in literary criticism from Columbia University. So literature was always around and I was the most obedient in that regard. So um, the start of my interest in formal studies uh, in, in English was spurned because I had this interest in dramaturgy for dance, an emerging field um, in use by contemporary dance artists uh, more increasingly, uh, but which is even then and now non-existent in the Philippines. So the second best choice was comparative literature. And that is what my friend Ruth Pison said, so there. So I'd like to approach uh, the topic, uh, discussing maybe rather esoterically for other people, but for me it's very concrete, uh, talking about two elements that we engage in as choreographers, two elements of dance, namely time and space. So dance defined as MC squared or energy and time and space. Um, the dance unfolds in time linearly, but each moment is in fact pregnant with both past and future. And dance is a moment where the past, present and future um, always converge and um, is always existential. So in fact, I needed another frame in which to approach time unfolding in a linear fashion in a way that is not ephemeral, not of the live arts, but in the non performing arts. So literature was the key, the way. And concretely within the field of comparative literature studies, 
it was uh, time and narratology. So the question was how how can one scientifically or empirically graph a, sto a story unfolding in time linearly, but can be presented non-linearly? So I had to view this process in a more tangible, conscious way, as if to grasp what I sense intuitively. Because by then, of course, I had a body of work. I had a strong sense of when to follow my intuition. But I needed a rigorous frame in which to see the structure of something and yet accommodate the freedom and spontaneity, which I have more of a sense of as a performer. So one of the most more memorable um, uh, classes I had was, of course, third world literature uh, under Professor Jing Hildago and both uh, Latin American literature and another, also under her Philippine literature in English. And the reason I mention it in the same breath is because she had the same approach uh, teaching it and that was that in those two kinds of literature dream and reality converge and collide uh, in two different spaces at the same time so in fact um, time and space are created simulta simultaneously as we know so thus in a sense literature for me is another is merely another space to migrate to which offers another view of time. Yeah. So that can seem abstract and esoteric because of course dance is an ephemeral art, but precisely going to literature or another non-performing art is a way to describe this, this, that this concept is in also very grounded. So like for instance, when you talk about literature or the writing of it, uh, one, a writer runs it in real life situations uh, making it more legible, um, understandable to the reader. And then with a good writer, there are openings, um, openings to maybe what you'd call transcendence. But for dance, it seems audiences view dance as abstract. Uh, but in fact, the audiences do not realize that the choreographic process is very grounded. And it is about finding concrete images that the human body can slip into into um, how a feeling can be rendered in the body. Uh, this is embodiment and of course every choreographer's task. Um, and it's as if that were not already obvious by everyone in this panel, there's politics in those choices. You know, choreography is not about stringing movements together like we always hear or making up the steps. What, is, what are the steps? It's making choices, both uh, moral and political. The choice of what is valuable to oneself, like for example, um, how a woman will hold herself, you know. So, uh, so your politics will enter about what kind of woman you you want to be in that situation. So then you find the embodiment of that. So that's one maybe particular example. So the study of um, of literature and my concentration was in the department was literary theory made me more articulate in, expl in explaining the politics inherent in creating a dance. Because of course, we all know that dance is also a text like literature and like film, but not, but not everybody thinks that way because they just want to be you know, entertained or it's ugly or you know, they have these notions of what a dance should be. But it's still a text and it's more difficult for people to think of dance as a text because it, it involves the human body and we're normally resistant when it comes to the human body you know we it, it is more the um, the connection to the self is more tight there's there's not much uh, space there and uh, sometimes you rebel against a different conception of of the body so but for me as a choreographer at that point in my career i needed the distance to see my work uh, the critical theory helped me give those tools for myself, As a, especially during that time, I could not really resonate with anyone, and only the conversation was with my own choreographic self. So, so uh, you know, uh, going to another discipline helped me. So, um, so again, this is to re reiterate that like the other arts, dance is also a great intellectual effort. The body follows if there's clarity in that thought process and but also 
in the same breath, this is not to say that spontaneity goes out the window when creating. Uh, no, the intellectual rigor in preparing something allows for greater spontaneity in the studio while choreographic, choreographing with dancers. So I want to give an example. So most of my choreographers, choreography especially in the beginning, were actually poems. I would um, get inspired by you know short um, short text. And because as dancers, we always have like little mantras every day, like uh, breathe and uh, be present. You know, you, you keep saying that as if discovering what this one phrase means to you during the whole day or during your own whole training, like what it means to pull up, what it means to, to, to be spi spiral, uh, uh, stand up in a spiral. I mean, it's just two, two words or a phrase and we um, we say that to ourselves like a mantra, like while we're dancing. So for me, in the beginning, it was really short poems, and many of my works take off from poems. But when I and and at that time, when I ventured to full work, full length work, they were um, mostly episode episodic, or in sweet form, or maybe vignettes and small vignettes. But put put together, it's like a full length story. But when I wanted to explore history in my work, the study of literature helped me tremendously. So again, the notion of time and maybe the most important work that, that can illustrate that is that of my version of Virginia Moreno's Itim Asu. So when I did her work and um, I, I discovered also that, of course, it is a play within a play, but that the earlier version that a, a national Alice, uh, artist, Miss Alice Reyes did was the play within the play, not, not the entire uh, drama. And I wanted to challenge myself that it was her entire play that I wanted to render in dance, not just the inner play. So for this, the concept of narratology helped me graph her work and how to translate it to, to choreography. As I said, uh, it's a play within the play. And then within the play itself, there is a blurring of fiction and the play's reality. So how to... Re Render this when dance is already characterized by simultaneities. And then the, you still have the background visual score on the video, which was another space, then another time construct one also had to create relationships with. So you had dance, uh, video, and history, each constructing specific time and space contract, constructs. And yet they had to come together as one, as a one and whole theatrical experience unfolding linearly in time. So, and then apart from this, I wanted to put another layer. I also wanted to quote in terms of choreographic style and dance history, Alice Reyes Itimasu, because I was doing a contemporary version and hers was in the modern dance idiom. Um, but besides that, I also want to reflect on my own process in reading history of the presentness of the live, live work as it's being performed, and which is my reading of the play as it reflects, for me, Virginia Moreno's problematization of history. And so I also wanted to reflect uh, the performances on present at the time and space it was produced. So my, my time and space and her time and space, which was on the eve of the declaration of martial law in the Philippines. So it's like so many layers. Since all of this was going on, mainly the past of which a place talks about, the place present, my present uh, talking about the play as a past event. So the multiple mirroring, which is my politics as a choreographer, I had to graph in narratological fashion, one who was speaking, whose points of view at this particular scene, if it was Virginia Moreno or me or Miss Alice Reyes or a view towards history, I had to graph that. And then also I had to determine what cues were available and, and which one could access in the work to convey this to various time space contract constructs. So this graphing I find is important and it's a bit scientific or, or empirical because it's important in defining the relationships because each medium has its specific time-space contract. And Chandraleka, this um, great Indian choreographer, once said, space is the encounter between moment, moment and relationship. So this all have to be threshold consciously so that collaborators can also contribute meaningfully. Otherwise, 
they will uh, overpower the work because they can they can be as creative, especially the video. They can take it somewhere. Then it's not anymore uh, in the direction that you wanted it. So, so but this is again not to say that this graphing, this linear process, always takes away that uh, that it takes away from the poeticity of the work, because as I mentioned earlier about literary theory informing and not detracting from the creative process, I find it true also about being clear about one's own frames, structures, and approaches. It, it enhances the extent to which one can be poetic. That's what I find. I don't, um, I don't shy away from this. I, I, find, uh, I find the rigor of uh, defining that um, very profitable for me to become more spontaneous and poetic. So, um, so this clarity in the approach gives the work this kind of sort of energy, its momentum. Yeah, and in a sense, this conscious process allows one to overcome inertia. If I were to put it in a choreographer's sense, because otherwise it would just stop, start, stop, start. You know, it. But if you're clear, you can sustain the momentum. Um, but then, um, giving that the um, talking from the creative sphere, um, I will just make uh, put distance to it. And ask then, but that process is not really complete because in the first place, where do you find the right questions to ask? I mean, where are you as a choreographer and how do you fine tune your vision or propel it to fru fruition? Oftentimes, the fruition of it is more arduous. So how do you even sustain it? So I think one of the val values I found in comparative literature studies was I was able to consciously locate my choreographic vision within the realm of thought, you might say. So it's like something like a thesis propo proposal. You ask yourself, um, what do you see around you? What is the body of work out there who has talked about this, this topic that you're talking about? And what is now the new proposition that you are offering? So because um, for, for us in con contemporary dance, we define choreography or we advocate for a practice, um, choreography as a critical practice, you know? So in this way, I could not only could I engage in this exercise for, for my own choreographic vision, but also the next step as a curator and as a mentor, I'm also able to help other artists so they can realize theirs. Because when you undergo that uh, thought process yourselves and you, you kind of um, thresh out all these things, you begin to know how younger artists or sense where they're going and you can help them um, you guide them toward the right questions so that they can realize it themselves. So that's the exercise that was beneficial for me and for other artists too. So it's, it's in a way, it's like teaching, but it's not in the academe. <laughs> so that's not another benefit of comparative literature studies as teacher and as mentor. Uh, the more you, for me, the more you locate your own choreographic vision, the more you can help others realize theirs. So yes. Another one is in the beginning, I mentioned that I was interested in dramaturgy and indeed, um, yeah, comparative lit literature helped me be my own dramaturg and dramaturg to others' work. But another part of the curation is creating a story for your entire initiative so that audiences will be interested in your pro program. I mean, in a sense, similar, it's probably similar to advertising or creating stories for your product, which in, in this case is a work of art that can be understood or can create desire or can be consumed. Because uh, when we started out, when we did a contemporary dance uh, festival, a contemporary dance practice was unheard of in the early years. So I had to, I had to find a story in a dr dramaturgical way and to connect it dramaturgically to what was happening in dance history so that, that I could explain this uh, practice to the audience. And mind you, it's not a form, it's a practice. And that's very difficult for others to accept. Yeah. So, um, so I think the acceptance of the practice of contemporary dance today is in large part due to the, you know, maybe the dramaturgical arc I chose in the beginning of our festival, which coincidentally was about the same time I started formal studies at the English department. So lastly, uh, it's my last topic. Lastly, I am now enrolled in my second MA during the pandemic. So media studies film. So this is another non-performing art and it's another medium that has intersections with dance and choreography as moving images. So it also intersects with, intersects with literature. And of course, I'm sure our next guest will be able to 
talk more about that. So, but for me, it, it's it's just a matter of intersecting knowledges, of knowing one through the other, such that I mean, if I were to describe my journey when I first um, took formal studies at the DCL, I was consolidating my knowledge uh, when I took my MA. And when I shifted my inquiry into film more extens- extensively, it was now at my age, <laughs> I guess, it was a way for me to understand what it is I know or to test if I, in fact, know anything. What I know has even, I don't know, practical value or artistic value in other fields. So it's like comparing knowledge, going into something to find out what kind of knowledge you actually by now possess. So because for me, and against other people, I mean, for me, dance is a form of knowledge. I mean, you have to ask, I ask myself, what kind of knowledge is choreography and dancing? So because there are always many ways of knowing. Knowing involves cognitive process of thinking, reasoning, verbalizing, act of sensing, and the emotional process of feeling. So dance ephemerality is a constraint because it's fleeting and gone in the next instance. But so the question for me is how do we even archive dance and present it to the world as knowledge? So these are the questions I ask, and there is not yet a definite answer to it. All I can offer is that the formal, formal study of literature is an approach better than most in threshing out this very question. The other part is communicating that knowledge to others in some form. So that's the next creative work. And while there are no definite answers to that, it doesn't matter because it is the act of even questioning one's knowledge that for me is valuable. And for me, there's politics in, in that gesture. And William Forsyth is a choreographer who extended uh, the ballet vocabulary, brought it to the 21st century, you might say. And uh, he asserts um, he asserts that knowledge and questioning is directly related to, do, to democracy and freedom. I mean, that's big. But yeah, maybe it is. I don't know. Yeah. In some way, if you practice criticality, you at least contribute and not maybe you're swayed by fake news so much. I'm not so sure. But, um, but the, the idea, the, the gesture of questioning is a gesture to empower the dance by creating uh, dance discourse. So going to formal literature studies can be viewed as a challenge to the self. And for me, it was a step further in finding a way how to share my knowledge to present dance as coherent, as, as knowledge-based. I mean, it means, it means to be in a conversation with other scientists. And also, I think literature is partly science also, as a science in and of itself. So, so there I've come. This is the end. I've come here with all the knowledge I've gathered through the years, uh, passed on in the form of a curator, choreographer, and lecturer. These are not separate from me, and going to formal studies of something other than one's art form can form can sometimes form part of some kind of resistance because it's a gesture to be visible and to speak, uh, like I'm doing here, to insist on my presence in this trying time. So that's what I have to share, and I hope. That's sufficient. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Mamaira. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll hold off on on uh, uh, comments, etc., um, so that we can go to our next speaker. Um, let me read again from. Uh, let me read you his background. Uh, internationally recognized for his work that often challenges convention. Stunning visual poetry and language in space. Playwright and director Anton Juan is a professor and theater director at the University of Notre Dame and a visiting professor at the DECL. He completed his PhD in semiotics at the Capodistrian and Panhellenic University of Athens. To honor his contributions to the arts, Juan has been knighted twice by the French government, receiving the, and pardon me if I won't read the French, but the, uh, the English translation, receiving the Order of the Arts and the Letters in 1992 and the National Order of Merit in 2002. He received the Alexander Onassis International Award for Theater and the Special Jury Prize for Screenplay from the Cine Manila International Film Festival. Beyond his work at Notre Dame, uh, Juan is also the founding artistic director of the Step of Angels Theater in Athens, Greece, and was the director general of Dulaang UP, UP Diliman, where he has taught at the DSCTA, DECL, and DEL, three departments. 
was also the fellow for drama at the Creative Writing Center of UP. His research, his research interests include language and space and theater towards social justice and semiotics and theater. The use of traditional theater in contemporized physical expressions or theater as critique of society and, and cultural schisms slash arts across the curricula. Let us all welcome Dr. Anton Juan. Thank you so much. It's always such a joy to come back to the heart. And I, uh, I, I was in pre-med before I came to the DECL. And um, I was in an advanced placement uh, from high school. So I was able to reach human anatomy. And how did I decide to go into the DECL? It was because while well, we were dissecting, I and my partner, we were dissecting the human body, which we took from the morgue, which in turn had come to the morgue from Bilibid Prison. I couldn't concentrate on the veins or the arteries or the organs. What I was thinking in my mind was, bakit walang nakiklaim ng body na to? What is the story of this body? You know, and so I was not meant to be a doctor. I was meant to go into something that would make me study the story of the human being. And I thought that English and comparative literature, which my sister had already been in um, and which proved so interesting because she, she would talk about so many things even when I was a child and, and in high school, you know, talk about authors and you know, dis discuss them with me. And so I was convinced that I was meant to go into the Department of English and Comparative Literature. The importance or significance of English studies and of late, because departments have expanded into Department of English uh, that have included within them creative writing and comparative literature uh, is that there especially in these times of forget, it is a portal to critical thinking. And critical thinking is simply uh, what we use with our imagination in the search for the meaning of why things happen in this world. Shall we explain through the mythical contexts, through historical contexts, through sublime context or intuitive spiritual connections of events with moods, the skies, the stars, our dreams, our megastates, our waiting? Shall we explain the occurrence of events as lies or as true witnessed events? But then again, who witnesses, who sees, who declares, who reports? who tweets from which I or truth or lie from the tower or from the top of the totem or truth and history from the cogwheels who touches the wound and most importantly what do we memorialize we ask these questions in English studies and comparative literature and as creative writers. And this is where the portal starts. And then when we start as students and start analyzing texts, we know that we are analyzing texts because we are not studying carpentry. <laughs> or we're not studying computer studies, or we are not um, uh, trying to solve a mathematical problem the whole day. We are there because we are looking for where the meaning grows from what we read in texts and from the relationship these texts have with us as us human beings reading texts if we still read texts and where 
to this all begin? Personally, and I always tell this to my students, I begin with a breath. Because the breath carries the utterance. Any sound starts with an arbitrary configuration of the tongue, the, you know, the, the lips, the, the chest, the, the, the guts, with the shoulders, the chest, the palate, the head, the nose, you know. You know. And these sounds just come out of our body sometimes. Like, you know, or, oh, oh, or mm. And this forms slowly the meanings of what these utterances maybe start to evolve into as meaning. And let's not, let's not discount the fact that when we say tongue, when we say, oh, it is the tongue, meaning to say the language, <laughs> it actually is literal, you know, for instance, I remember Ben Cervantes, <laughs> he could not say Baliu because he was an American. You remember me, Beth? <laughs> he could not say Baliu, he would say Baliu. Okay, Ben, say Giliu, Giliu. <laughs> you know? that, all, that all begins because from his being a, 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 a Lee, he was a Lee Holcomb. Yeah, he was of an American descent and, and, and foreigners cannot say you. And that's precisely why Lilio became Lilio you know, in its formation. So you have this evolution of, of the tongue and it's lit, actually literal. When you talk, when you're teaching French, you say, eh, but you tell, I tell my students when I teach French, say, you say e with your tongue, e, now say you with your mouth, e. So that's how you pronounce the U. So, you know, you study the formation of the tongue. And, and when we're looking at, when we study language, we eventually find out that even in the history of art and its relationship to language, you have formations in sculptures that are formations of utterances and have something to do with the concept of what they were trying to express. This is the phi woman, phi. It forms the round and that in Greek, phi. Phi. The circular as against the linear. And the f is a pleasant sound. And when you say f, in Greek, it means the, the bearer of joy, like, like Ephrosin, you know, anything that begins with F, F Haristo, you know, that means thank you or uh, uh, bringing of the joy when you say thank you. And what does this mean? This is the pregnant woman. This was their figure of the pregnant woman the round and that. The sound of happiness is the sound of the pregnant woman during the Neolithic period. So immediately you have relationships between sounds and sculptures. So you see that there is already somehow a connection between just the word, the sound or how it's written and how it corresponds to their concept of human beings and as produced in works of art. So when we start with sound and we look at the formation of sound, where, where do we go next? Naturally, from sounds, we go into words, right? So uh, is not ug, is not bug, is not bun is not but, is not otto, is not uti, is not. In other words, when we start to create the word, we're looking at words now, yeah, with their oppositions against one another. So in the formulation of the critical thinking, we're starting to look at difference. 
And the difference yeah, creates the meaning. When we say a concept of, let's say, man, man, God, man, woman, man, child, man, ant. But maybe ant is better than man. And when we start to look at their meanings, we're already looking at how the attitudes are forming within the contrasts that are happening. Yes. The oppositions are now creating a, an attitude. So what he, why is this important? How does this lead us to other arts? Well, when we look at, let's say, uh, a piece of iron, yeah, an, an iron, plancha, okay. And then we, we associate plancha with our nanai, or we associate plancha with a lola, we associate plancha with mama, you know, especially in the Mediterranean <laughs> parts of, of, of Europe. Mama, eh, puro mga, ano yan, stock of mga polo shirts, ganyan, ganyan, ng mga sons who live with their mamas till they're age 65, you know, that sort of thing. And then, but when you look at the plancha, you speak, you, you smell the bagong plancha, di ba? You, you smell, naamoy mo pa, ewan ko kung hanggang ngayon, ganun, pero maamoy mo, depending on the context of that plancha, yung amoy ng ng saging, ng balat ng, ng, ng dahon ng saging, di ba? Na, so, nahaamoy mo ang isang bahay, ang isang nanay, ang isang lola, naamoy mo isang kasambahay na mabait, na naalala mo na nagpa-plancha ng yung mga damit. Okay. So, there is a concept of like plancha equals domesticity, equals kindness, equals uh, a, a softness. Plancha, there, on the caballo, cold, cold, huh? not hot. And I say this because anytime, how many of us have like, when we see the plancha, we go, <laughs> we touch it to see whether it's cold or hot, right? So immediately, when you even you see plancha, there's already cold or hot. And drunk man comes home, yeah? takes the plancha, it's not hot, but you see the possibility of a burning iron, yes? And it goes to the face of the woman. Ito ah, tandaan mo ah, I love you ah, tandaan mo. And puts the iron down. So immediately, that iron, creates a field of semim or a field of opposition and strongly is laden with attitudes and contexts, social contexts, the gender context, yeah? The role of the woman. What is the man to the woman? And slowly as we're moving through this signs, and I'm looking at this semiotically, of course, and that is the way I look at how signs or texts create other meanings in other visualizations and in other ironies of, of meaning that can probably bring out other fields of meaning and become intertextual, interdisciplinary, you know, when, uh, when I read um, Summer Solstice, for instance, of Nick Joaquin, I uh, transformed it in 1976 when the faculty center was still, was still not unused. The lobby was still unused. And it was the summer of 76. I sat down in that corner, much to the chagrin of uh, of Senora Ventanilla, who could not cross because we were rehearsing, <laughs> we were rehearsing some results, and then slowly that, that lobby became the faculty center laboratory theater. Anyway, so we were doing uh, some results, transforming it into dialogue, dance, and um, 
and mime, Nick Joaquin, we invited. And of course, he came with his beer and everything. And we were so frightened. I was so frightened. Nick Joaquin does not, does not have any respect for the protocols of theater. If he doesn't like something, he'll say, boo, you know. If he doesn't like something, he'll say, pañata, you know. The kind of thing, he'll get, get out of there, you know, like, go, boo, boo, you know. And he will say all kinds of Spanish expletives. But he loved it. He loved the show. And then see how that influenced the playwright himself, who later on turned the short story into a play. But that's how the chains of meanings evolve, you see. And uh, that is how literature can get turned into other texts. I have worked with Myra Beltran as well on texts of Victor Hugo, for instance, um, turning the poems and paintings of Victor Hugo into gargoyles, whispers and cries yeah? um, for the French spring at some point. Mm. How does this happen? I mean, how, how do you create a, a film out of theater. How, when you read James Joyce, will you suddenly see such a beautiful film like John Huston's, you know, uh, the, the Dead, you know? How can you see how the music of James Joyce, yeah, is found so intact in the film itself that when you look, when you watch the film, you are also remembering the text. It is, not always the, it is not always the case because sometimes there are films that are so, well, like take Dr. Zhivago, for instance. Okay, you know, all I remember from it is the snow. You know. And of course, Omar Sharif. And, and, uh, but uh, some films are really so, you can probably ask Bibeth that later on because Bibeth is a writer and how probably Bibeth turns texts into, into films. And um, the way now I'm transforming uh, our town of, of, uh, of Thornton Wilder into Amon Banwasa La Wood, but transforming it into the mangrove islands memories of fisher folk and narratives in the mangrove island of Suyak. With, of Suyak, with a, with a thought that uh, no island nor no people should ever be forgotten. Answering what I answered before of what do we memorialize? I look at the line and I would like to give credit, of course, always will give credit to my mentors in the DECL. Uh, in literature and the other arts, I had Pachot Fernandez, Professor Fernandez. Oh, I'm going to cry now. <laughs> Pachot was so wonderful because she, she allowed me again, there you go, there's a repetition of Myra's, Myra's first, uh, first one, but uh, well, I'm older than Myra. So when I did uh, my, my poems of Virgin Moreno into fan dances, um, that was my project for Pachot Fernandez when I did um, Billy Can Make Me Three Masks, you know, Virginia Moreno's most beautiful poem, you know, on, on the three faces of a woman. Philomela. Before she was raped. And of course, the fan stabs the vagina, which you can't see right now because yes. Make, make for him a crown that will in colors raise the devil's horns. You know, and so you transform, you transform an object into many, many things. And so it is this transformation of meanings, which is very important in the search for the visualization of a metaphor, or when you want to say a sign is that which it is not. A fan ceases to be a fan. A chair ceases to be a chair. 
when we human beings are the ones who give the meaning to it. If I'm writing right now on this chair and doing this and uh, hello, you know, or, or turning it into a horse, you know, then the chair is no longer a chair. Or this chair, which I'm supposed to sit on, you know, suddenly sits on me or, you know, I would love to see Duterte trying to sit on a chair and do a short film on it. And the chair keeps moving away, moving away, moving away. And then finally the chair sits on him. The chair does not want to be sat on. And this is how the ironies come to us. And this I think was implanted in me when through stylistics, which is the field that I learned so much and so closely from Professor Nieves Epistola. Okay. She said, repetition, variation, and contrast. That became the framework of the search for how objects and texts become pictures and language in space. How you look for it. It's repetition, variation, and contrast. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Sir Anton. All right. Uh... Before we go into discussion, uh, <laughs> questions, si Ma'am Judy, naloloka na ba kayo? Um, if so, that's great. Um, please, uh, again, uh, keep the questions coming. Uh, if you have uh, thoughts, ideas, uh, we welcome them in the chat box and in the Q&A box. Um, meanwhile, we are uh, going to listen to our third speaker. Uh, Bibeth Orteza graduated from the University of the Philippines, Diliman, with a Bachelor of Arts degree in English in 1975. She was a fellow for various international and local workshops, namely the Eric Morris Acting Workshop in New York, the Actors Workshop in Manila, the Siliman University Summer Writers Workshop at Siliman University, and the UP Writers Workshop at UP Diliman. She enjoyed success as a comedian on film and television and as a writer for top-rated television programs and award-winning films. She alternated with Piwi O'Hara as Nana Rosa in, Rod in Rodi Vera's play of the same title about comfort women in the Philippines during World War II, staged by the Dulaang UP and directed by Jose Estrella. She was Pilar in Peter Zaragoza, Maishles Dolorosa, directed by Jenny Hamora for Tanghalang Ateneo, from August 15 to 31, 2019. Earlier in February 2019, she played early astronomer Annie Cannon in Repertory Philippines' second restaging of Lauren, Lauren Gunderson's Silent Sky. In July 2017, she did Wild Rice Productions' fourth incarnation of Mark Camoletti's Boeing, Boeing in Singapore, with the Straits Times noting her performance as Rosa was masterful and scene-stealing. She also directs shows for television and theater. A breast cancer survivor now in her 18th year of remission, Orteza is the spokesperson of breast cancer information advocate, I Can Serve Foundation. Currently chairman of the Concerned Artists of the Philippines, she was regent of the University of the Philippines from 2010 to 2013 and served as a member of the Movie and Television Review and Classification Board of the Philippines from 2013 to 2018 until the, until the Duterte government deemed her unfit. Let us listen to Bibeth Orteza. It, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm glad to be here and to, to, see, to see Anton on performance level as usual. But, okay. English studies, including the study of literature, poetry, plays, short stories, novels, mostly from Great Britain, Ireland, United States, and any other English speaking countries of the world, but including, of course, our very own. I discovered the greatness of Philippine literature in English and Philippine literature in Filipino, in Tagalog, 
because of my studies as um, an English major. I wasn't an English major from the get-go. In high school, I read a lot. I was a um, literary editor, but I wanted to be a lawyer like my dad. So I set out for political science. Even in policy, I was already flirting with the arts. I remember as a Phi Delta Alpha sorority neophyte, Anton Juan, whom I met for the first time, was directing Exit the King, starring Loris Guillen and Jonas Sebastian. So I'm there, they're making the billboards for the, for the play. And then Anton, who I didn't know he was going to be my friend, but he just said, you, can you please um, stomp on, on, on paint and then using my fingerprints, yun ang ginamit niya in the billboard. You remember that, Anton? So, so no, right? I was thinking, oh, I could do this. I could uh, double in theater arts while still on the poli sci course. Alas, and a lock, poli sci had two major math courses, math 11 and math 105. Algebra and intermediate algebra. I flunked math 11, looked around, asked around. Uh, lo and behold, I had a wonderful teacher who gave me a grade of one in English for. Anton also mentioned her name, Pachot Fernandez. She was the one who told me, you could go to English, you write well. At that time, yung wala pang creative writing program eh. Imaginative writing. So, minor in comparative lit. And nako, ang saya ko kasi ang, ano lang, ang, ang math, basic arithmetic requirement, math one. My dear Aunt Sally, multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. And thus began the greatest years of my days as a student. You know, you study, study these subjects in English and it's like doors are open to you. I mean, can you imagine, man? In stylistics, I also had uh, Mrs. Epistola, Nieves Epistola. And Nieves Epistola, if you did well in, in her class or pointed out something that you really liked, she would give you a book. I got my first Gabriel Garcia Marquez from her. They were all nurturing sa mga estudyante nila. My, my teacher in Philippine literature and English was Franz Arceliana. Also my teacher in short story and advanced short story writing. Mr. Arceliana, I remember, he read a paragraph from the short story I had submitted that day. And then he walked to the window he took off his glasses and then he was wiping his glasses and then I, I said, sir, and then he said, you can call me Franz. I do not know how I was able to reach home that night. I must have floated from UP Diliman to where we lived. My teachers, Amelia Bonifacio in playwriting and advanced playwriting, Alex Fofana in poetry, Jimmy Abad for Shakespeare, but also still Apollonia Chua of Philippine Lit in Filipino. I never let go of, of my contacts with, with Philippine, um, Philippine material in English. And even when I was doing that, I don't know if you still have that now, no, but in our time, my baby thesis, eh? um, I chose to analyze two works of a waray, of a waray waray um, author. And to my, to my great fortune, Professor Ria Lubit, Professor Lilia Ria Lubit was the one who also took on students in Bicol, Cebuano, and she encouraged you. So it wasn't like you were 
you were betraying your own literature because you were studying, I mean, you know, you didn't as an English major, it was so great for me to not only find out how, how Winnem was really spelled, but also all these great materials in, in Philippine short story and Philippine short stories. And thus it was such, it was such a great love affair. I mean, now my greatest problem as somebody who went to a course that required a lot of reading, very few like to read. It's like they've stopped reading. So, I'm, and here I am at my age, I'm 68. Anton, I will insist, hey, look, I'm 45. Okay, uh, I'm 68. Pero hindi na sila nagbabasa. I'm nakakainis because I'm going back to, to my short stories in English. I'm taking advantage of of mga um, the the copy books, you know, you you get a book like this, and then my Australia albums and everything. And you know what? I, I discovered, you know what I discovered now. Wala pang soap opera sa Pilipinas ang material ng ating mga short stories in English. Soap opera na. I'm, I'm, I'm dreaming. I mean, look at the short stories of Estrella Alphone. How do you present that on television? Magnificence. Now that we're already talking openly about how children should be made wary of, of predators, of pedophiles. And that was such an advanced piece of work, magnificence. Fairy Tales in the City, Hilda Cordero Fernando. That's, that's a teleserie right there. Talagang, even now, I'm, I'm thinking with the war in Ukraine, uh, if there will ever be a time when our short stories get to be translated and shot in, take for instance, Argelius, how my brother Leon brought home a wife. Take it out of the setting and not grab gun. You're in Ukraine, the Ukraine. Ganun pa rin? Ganun pa rin yung kwento? I mean, that's a short story. I'll never get tired of reading about it. Binabasa ko siya ulit na ulit. And yun ang talagang, it's just about eight pages yata. But look, eight pages, and yet, kasha kasha na doon yung beginning, middle, and end. Practically, the first paragraph begins telling you about this about Maria smelling like papayas, and then yung last paragraph smelling like papayas na naman si Maria. I mean, wow. And then I remember, because of, of my batch, I was the one who went into television. Uh, well, I stupidly thought that um, because you graduated from UP, you could just go to the College of Law and enroll. So I went there and then they said, uh, I said, kailan ng enrollment sa next semester? Then they said, anong pangalan mo? And then they were looking at the list, meron palang lae. I didn't know that. So uh, I said, okay, I'll be back. So I got a job in, in KBS as a junior writer for news and public affairs. But, but what I brought with me, all the reading, gave me such confidence that, for instance, uh, I, June on, sometime in May, the woman I didn't know was going to be my mother-in-law Armida Sigunrena was going to shoot um, Aawitan Kita in the Emilio Aguinaldo house in, in Cavite. She fought with the writer, Marina Ferrego Gonzalez. 
So her executive producer, who was my friend, said, uh, Armida, I have a new friend. Uh, she's a fresh graduate. Um, you want to try her out? So I met with her and then she said, uh, Armida said, if you can write me a material about a Filipino musical talking about Kalayan, this will be shown on, Valen on Independence Day. I mean, you do not dare a UP graduate in, this, in 1975 to write something about kalaya, kalayaan. So I did it. And then sunod, sunod na yon, even when I didn't know what I was going to be writing about, I just said yes, because that's the confidence that UP's Department of English and Comparative Literature gave me. Doors was just the opening. Ay, ganito pala yon. Ay, doon nakakonect yon. Doon. And wow, your teachers, you know, when having, having gone into, into television, I remember there was this time I, I got kind of sad because some of my friends were teasing me. English major ka pa rin pagkatapos ang, big, ang, ang biggest work mo naman is school bukol. So I was in UP for something. And then I saw uh, my, my playwriting and advanced playwriting teacher see, Mom, Mom Amelia La Peña Bonifacio, sabi ko, Mom, sabi ko, uh, okay lang ba sa inyo na yung lahat ng tinuro ninyo sa akin, ina-apply ko sa school bukol? Ayun ako, Bibet. Lahat ng susulatin mo, lahat ng isusulat mo pa, school bukol pa yan, kahit anong comedy, galing yan sa lahat ng pinag-aralan natin at pinag-usapan sa klase mo. Kaya iba ang panulat mo. Kasi, going back dun sa nabanggit na ni Mayra kanina, kasi nga, may frame. May frame at may, may hulmahan. So, now I'm, I'm thinking, what do we do now about generations so, who don't like to read anymore? How do we make them read? Do we translate um, Philippine short stories into television shows? It's hard to get those approved because the young TV producers now, they barely read Philippine literature. Wala halos talagang nabasa. But still we must continue because hindi ito pwedeng, hindi ito pwedeng itapon. It's, it says so much about about us, about, I mean, I close my eyes and I remember scenes from Espeleta, Australia, Alpon. I close my eyes and I remember the many, many more writings, even in Tagalog, because they are all related, English and Tagalog, but the structure. You get introduced to the structure, you get introduced to the frame, and you appreciate with the same level that you appreciate fairy tales from the city, that you appreciate morning in Nagreb Khan with something written in Tagalog by Mabini Centeno, maghilong man ay balantukan. Spareho. Pareho ang structure. You know, right now, right now I have two, I have two materials on my drawing board. Um, I've, I've already had the materials copyrighted, so I feel comfortable sharing it openly now. One is, one is Knock Knock. It's about a history professor who's on the verge of discovering a portal that will bring him back to the past so he can see if there are things he can correct in history. But he also finds out that his wife has terminal cancer. He leaves the hospital in a half. His children follow him thinking he's going to commit suicide. And then yun pala, he's able to crack through the portal and the children are staring at the island of Limasawa, Limasawa when the Philippines was first discovered. This is where I am at now. 
and another story also as well. Lorante at Laura, a retired Filipino teacher who has a gay, gay, a gay daughter, but is so upset because even Florante at Laura ginagawa ng gay talk. Laura ali, la, Laura ang aliw niya ring budhi. Kandungan niya ring char. Mga ganyan, no? And then, the partner, the other partner is saying na, you know, uh, your father cannot be so upset at these changes because language evolves. Take the word wika, for instance. In the time of Balagtas, wika was not W-I-K-A. It was U-I-C-A. Yung, yung mga ganun na ano. But then, they realize that it's, the op it's your openness of spirit that matters. I mean, you know, there's a line in the film that says, okay, alam ko naman na nagbabago. Nagbabago ang, ang tanggap at paggamit natin ng wika. Pero anak, isipin mo naman. Na yung mga sinaunang trabaho ni Shakespeare, sinasalin yon sa mga pahina ng mga pare na nakatira sa mga kastilyo. Hindi kagaya ngayon na social media na ang nagsasabi sa akin na ang spelling ng dilaw ay delaw. Na ang spelling ng mukha ay wala ng H, mukha. So I'm, I'm trying to get this, this subjects off the ground and into into workable projects because i really want to to push for us not forgetting that we have a language that we have our own literature napakalaki para sa akin ang ugnay ng pagkamakabayan at ng wikang pilipino sabihin mo na sabihin sa akin na ang salitang na lang ay isang buong salita Ikaw na lang para mo kong sinasaksak. Ayusin natin. Ilipit natin kahit konti-konti ritong basura. Sige, malay nga natin dumating ang pagkatataon na mai, mai lahat natin ng mga kwento ng ating mga manunulat sa telebisyon. Pero kung yun ang magsisimula sa pagbabalit ng hilig ng tao sa pagbabasa, bakit hindi? So, nagsimula lahat eh. Naalala ko noon nung uh, si Conrado de Quiroz, yung anak niya, nahilig ng gusto sa pagbabasa ng Harry Potter. Sabi niya sa akin, I don't care if it's Harry Potter. What matters most to me is he went back to reading. At yan, yan ang talaga nating dapat uh, pagtulungan gawin to, to revive the love of reading. I mean, parang people are just into social media, into looking at my cell phone, what's in my cell phone, what do we read, at mga ganyan. I have, one of my, I think I would count as one of my greatest achievements is I have a daughter. Um, she never had a boyfriend because she says she can't look for a man. She can't find a man who will allow her to read. Okay. Um, but she loves reading. She loves reading so much. We had a bad fight once because I had shifted to Kindle. And then he, she said, Mama, how can you enjoy a book that you cannot hug at the end of a really good page? How can you enjoy reading something na hindi mo na yung smell of ink? Yun ang proud ako na mahilig siya magbasa. Pero we cannot be just content that our children are, are enjoying reading. We have to continue. I mean, the little things, the little windows. You know, my husband, Carlitos, worked with Mayra Beltran. And... Uh, they had a, a young actor there. That was the first uh, appearance of my son, Sirafa, with Myra. All these little windows. I think responsibility natin of our generation to keep on going back, pushing, 
pushing. I mean, wow. I got to be me because of everything that I learned, well, also outside of school, my sense of activism. But from the UP Department of English and Comparative Literature. Walang, wala akong nasayang na moment noon. Walang nasayang na oras. Even if in my spare time, I, I used to have such a big rush on my Shakespeare teacher, Jimmy Abad, his Volkswagen in the parking lot. I would really, really uh, shower with bougainvillea blossoms. Jimmy Abad would have, and uh, Professor Dadu Falsa would have tea every afternoon in Professor Dadu's office. And then I would always go there to eavesdrop. Lulu Reyes got so upset. She'd always pull me away, ano ba? But wow, wow, what? You know, I just love the, the DECL so much. Even if there were some professors there who wouldn't allow you to attend rallies, because there's a class, you just didn't care. Talagang mahal na mahal namin yung, ano, yung area na yun as a group na, kasi at that time, you know, at that time, um, ang, ang IMC, IMC Institute lang yun eh. My history teacher was, was uh, Teodoro Agoncillo and every day he would rant and rave. Anong classing course yan, journalism? Pinag-aaralan ba yung journalism? You want to be a writer for a newspaper, you be an English major. You can only write well if you read well. Sabi niyang ganun. But yun ang, but wow, UP. UP naming mahal. Pamantasang hirang. So, salamat UP. Yun lang. Thank you. Thank you very much. May I just remark before we go into some of the questions uh, here, um, really how, how interesting and performative this whole uh, webinar has been. It has so many different layers um, and it's certainly not uh, shaping up to be you know, just uh, your conventional webinar, I think. Uh, I hope you're enjoying it as much as I have been. Uh, I also have a lot of questions in my head, but... Um, Given that as moderator, I am tasked to uh, relay questions from the audience. <laughs> so uh, let me dive into some of the questions that have gathered in our chat box. Uh, we are opening the floor for um, questions uh, for those who are in the audience uh, here in Zoom or on Facebook. Um, otherwise, uh, again, you are free to chime in with thoughts if you'd like uh, instead of questions. Uh, and just join the conversation uh, freely. Uh, so we'll kick off with um, some observations on commonalities that audiences have. Uh, here, there's a question here, what seems to be common in all your experiences is the narrative element. And it is understandable how literature relates to other arts in terms of storytelling. Do you think the study of English can have a similar value in arts? that aren't as narrative heavy or time-based, I suppose, like, uh, like media, film, uh, and theater. Uh, so the examples here would be uh, painting, sculpture, or instrumental music. Um, is there anyone in our panel who would like to respond? Although I'm inclined to, to throw it to Sir Anton <laughs> for, uh, um, well, your, your deep immersion in semiotics. For example, so let's say if you're studying um, uh, E. Cummings, okay, I'm, I'm going to go because he's saying English studies. So I'm going to go straight into that. So if you're going, let's say, if you're studying E. e. Cummings, Grasshopper, which by the way, I always erase the title when I give it to my students and let them find out what the last word is. So if you have like all these letters jumping, yeah, and trying to form eventually the shape or the word Grasshopper, in the end, and first it's utterances and then it goes like letters. And you're looking at them as lines that form like this, you know, going toward and like that. And then it, there's a long line and then it, there's a falling line. It's like music. So we go, ding, bum, bum, bing, ding, 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 ding,
Runium, you know, like jump, bum, 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 bum. Grasshopper, you know. You can you can see how the the letters you know are forming a line of music or a line of movement so that the linear becomes broken lines you know and then it becomes also if you want to look at it when you compare it to nonlinear uh, literature or nonlinear uh, time because time was destroyed by by uh, by Henri Bergson uh, where you know where he says there's no time there's only duration so you have like durations of moments you know as you have in movement and language and space so um to that the relationship of time and and movement it's the same thing for instance when you're doing japanese theater and you want to say um uh I have crossed, and it's longer than that, okay? So let's take a three-page uh, uh, a pay, a three play will take a whole day. So if you think, if, if, the, if the actress says, I have crossed from that side of the river to the other, and it's such a long chant where the body is slowly getting crumpled. So it's time that works on the body with just one sentence. And that, and, that, and that the actor has transformed. So you can see that in the, in the, um, in the study of text, there is the, the, the notion of your visualization or dramatization. You know, when Henry James was asked, how do you write? And he's a fictionist, right? He's a fiction writer. And Henry James was asked, excuse me, Mr. Henry James, uh, how do you write your, your fiction? He said, dramatize, dramatize was his answer. So there you have that, you have that relationship between, you know, the texts and how they grow into language and space. Of course, you have to be imaginative, huh? If you're, if you're a lazy, you know, a reader, never mind, you know, go, go na lang make balut and be good at it and you will earn money pa. In other words, you know, a critical thinking is, it's, holds the responsibility of imagination. We must, you know, we must claim the will to imagine what we read. We must claim to imagine what we see. But if you're just like, as Bibet said like this, Musta, Tanka, you know, S-A-N-K, you know, Sanka. S and K, no vowels, things like that. If you're like that shortcut kind of a human being, well, then that's why the responsibility of a teacher or even like a friend, you know, who would like to teach somebody else is to show this imaginative world, you know, that there are imaginative worlds other than a text. Beautiful. Would, would other uh, panelists like to chime in also? No, I'm already I'm already in on what Anton is saying. So <laughs> yes, yes, I agree. It's I know because you just need to be aware that when one, I mean, it's not biblical, but in in, in English studies, literally, a door is closed, a window opens. And daming, and daming duktong, and daming, and daming pupuntahan. Na, I'm so glad I went through, I went through college without, without cell phones. Otherwise, I would have been distracted. Wala talaga eh. Wala talagang. You know, can I can I like uh, <laughs> respond to respond to Bibeth because she was talking about algebra and and all that. <laughs> I have difficulties too, you know, in polynomial equations later on though <laughs> in my life. I started, let me look at polynomial equations again. And how did I look at polynomial equations? 
by telling, by teaching, <laughs> I had to learn polynomial equations in order for me to teach public school teachers yeah, how to transform subjects to be more interesting by using the arts. So I had to challenge myself before telling them how to transform a polynomial equation into a dance. Transform a polynomial equation into dance. And apparently teachers who tried to use this, you know, in their classes got more responses from their students and their students started to love mathematics because like, you know, if, if A squared, you know, after, you know, if you, you, you assign like movements to the, to each, you know, symbol, and they start to remember, they start to look at the choreography as, as equation, as signs, you know, or valuations of that particular symbol. So, you know, and then, so it becomes far, far more interesting in their minds. It becomes really imaginative. But 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 I had to mem I had to memorize the polynomial equations. <laughs> but I'm sure you I'm sure you failed and I failed <laughs> during that time. But as time has grown, we transform too. And I think an important, maybe as a way of responding uh, to the question and to also draw from the discussions that have uh, occurred in the course of the conversation, I think an important insight that also uh, stood out to me particularly uh, in, in, in thinking about how uh, literary studies, for example, or theory kind of feeds into uh, the other arts. Uh, that's one way of looking at it. But I think an important turn that we've also taken in the course of the discussion is how we begin to understand also how our practice in the other arts has kind of changed our view of literature. It's so uh, fascinating to me also how uh, you have discussed uh, the materiality of language. Language is something that's visual, uh, that's visual, that's sensorial, that has sound and life and breath. And so um, maybe a lot of the young scholars here, for example, lots of literary majors, literature majors, I think, in the audience um, might, be, might tend to think about, you know, how uh, literature kind of informs our practice in the other arts, but it also goes, you know, the other way around, how the other arts also allows us to kind of experience uh, literature differently. Uh, we on the subject of transformation, uh, we do have uh, two questions here on, on translation and adaptation. So may I just um, answer, uh, I'll read them both in, in one breath. Um, there's one here on, uh, well, they're all from anonymous attendees. So one question one, I'm interested in Myra Bell Trans notion of time and space as rendered in dance and literature. I am curious if language, the stuff of literature, is also translated in dance. Does this help in navigating and practicing these arts? But maybe also in, in, uh, in conjunction of the, the other question here relating to translation also, there seems to be a common experience in adaptation in your experience as artists. How do you explain your training in literary studies and English informs your process of adaptation um, and then the other half is, how do you handle questions of authenticity and comparison that haunt adaptations and interlinguistic and intermedium translations? Maybe we can answer the last one a little bit later. Uh, for now, maybe we can jump off on the questions on translation and um, adaptation with Mamaira. Uh, well, I like that the question is the word translation because in fact, um, you know, the combination is interpretative dance you know but it, it's not and and maybe also my my answer is related to the first question uh like you know like doing a painting or a sculpture and and the the first question about storytelling meaning narrative right but when you have a story as Anton earlier said like there are layers of meaning there are chains of meaning so in a in an artwork such as a painting it's it has layers of meaning, right? It's just uh, in, 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 one, in one image. So, um, and then related to that then is this idea of um, the stuff of language, um, language is stuff of literature. Um, 
you know, comparative literature helped me to, because I already had the words before, but it made me more articulate about it, this notion of trace. Because as, as Anton said, a sign is a chain of meaning. It, it leads to another meaning. And actually, dance is traces. You don't see actually movement. What Dance is what happens in between. That's dance. It's not the steps. But how you connect it, how the energy flows from one to the other, that's the dance for me. So it's not just the, 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 the how do you say, the, the, the text on themselves, but what they're pointing to. Because I, I have this idea that all these arts, and also even for me as a practitioner, as a choreographer, the core of my work, I never say it to my dancers, but I say everything around it. I say everything around it, you know, and when they click, they have it. So it's actually more pure because they got what's around it and uh, they, they heard what's around it, but they got a sense of the core, right? And, and, and that's how you translate literature to dance when you have the sense of that core. And also like what you said earlier, like dance, um, literature has to smell. It has, images have to smell. Uh, it has to be tactile, like um, maybe I know it's elections now, but I'm sorry, this was the latest thing that I did. Like it's easier to do um, instead of like I found what Lenny Robredo says, so easy to choreograph. Kapag tumindig ka, may titindig sa tabi mo. Tumindig, tabi mo, you already have the rhythm. You already have the movement, you already have the momentum. So it's the tactility of the language, right? That, like it smells, it, it's, it's kinetic. It's a kinetic kind of language. It's not all language. That's why you have the craft of the writer. It makes it smell, it makes it move. Or like, you know, when, you, when she says, Pinag, walang katumbas ang pinagbigkis nating lakas. So pinagbigkis. And, and like if you were a visual artist, you would say the image is, yeah, Ben Cervantes and Chino Roses, um, nakabigis in, in the Menjola Bridge, right? But I was saying, um, maybe that's more of an earlier image. Maybe the, the latter image, because she also said, um, titindi pang laban. So for me, the, the more, uh, let's say, immediate contemporary image, image was the squid game, you know, tug of war. Parang yun talaga pinagbigis na mahirap matindi. So, what I'm trying to say is language has to be that for me. Um, when, when, I, um, when, I trans, when I find like poetry that I like to translate to dance, I already know the first movement. I know the, already the impulse to move. It's, it's language that smells, that's tactile. So, and then already has layers of meaning. It's, it's boring if it's just, okay, one thing after another. It, it, it's not pregnant with meaning. It has to be pregnant with meaning because the body is, is moving simultane simultaneously. You know, as one part is going, another part is going. So you have to have that like pregnant, uh, image pregnant with meaning in order for it to be translated to dance. That's for me. So, and that pregnant with meaning is, means layers of meaning. And they're not found in the actual words, but in the interstices of the words of the text so so yeah that's it <laughs> beautiful um would uh sir anton or miss bibeth want to chime in on your process of adapting and translating uh literary works um, the last thing in, in, in 2019 i uh, we did an adaptation of uh Steinbeck's of mice and men for uh tanghalang filipino and it was uh, untitled Katsuri. Katsuri is a rodent. It's not quite rodent. It's not quite, it's, it's, it's a shrew. And in that adaptation, I wanted to, that was the time because people were being, were being human rights lawyers, were being slain. And I accommodated that into, into the material. And then I wanted to, for instance, say, that the problems of the Sakada wasn't Negros centered. So I had the journey of, of the characters of, of George and Lady um, moving from Ascenda Luisita back to 
uh, Negros where they had really originated from. And then you had to update it and, uh, and make it. We were surprised uh, with the audience response because we were doing we were doing well and uh, performing to, to sold out audiences but i think it was because ang sinundan talaga is yung pagka pilipino na inherent doon sa material so it didn't have to be like uh like some america no uh it's is a the, the oppression of the oppression of the small people was the theme na sinundan. So Steinbeck to Shenda Luisita and to Katsuri and to, and to Negros with references to uh, my statements like if, if this thing doesn't work here, punta tayo sa Bacolod, may, ay sa Bukid doon, may mga Shenda rin doon. We were trying to, to hit the whole, uh, the whole area. That's what I followed. Well, there, in following off of the two speakers before me who, um, and concurring with the idea of text and context, yeah, because this is, this, this is the, uh, the basic, oh, if we go back again to English studies and comparative, this is the basic dual, you know, dual task of, of, an, of an English teacher or, or a comparative literature teacher is to teach text, context, okay. In the spirit of adaptation, there are there are texts which are not necessarily literary texts. There are texts that are oral texts. There are texts that are forbidden texts. There are texts uh, that are socio social science texts, political science texts. You know, many texts that you can put together. Um, in fact, even visual visual uh, arts and and even previous dance performances that you can watch that you can slowly try to create a work from. In other words, for instance, in my work now that I'm going to be doing, um, uh, I I'm doing a dictator's ball. Okay. This starts from the historical uh, um, event that Pinochet, the, dicta the dictator of Chile, was invited only once in his life, in his whole presidency, you know, to attend a state visit, to make a state visit. And the only one who invited him was guess who? Marcos. Midway, however, Marcos told him, don't continue with your state visit. Maybe some people had whispered to him, don't do this, you know? But he was already somewhere. Yeah, I don't know if it was Guam or Hawaii. I still have to research on that. But they moved, they turned back. Why? So I, the, I begin with that question. Why? was Pinochet told to turn back. So I started to read researches, you know, on the politics of torture and uh, the Guantanamo diary to see how, com how comparative first present uh, methods of torture are, you know. And so I came up with a, a kind of a premise that the reason why Marcos uh, stopped him was that he was going to lose in the dictator's dinner. He was going to lose in the, in, the, in the conversation, like who is the better dictator between us, you know? And Pinochet would just tell him, you know, you're trying to be a statesman. You're trying to look for uh, the Filipino and the democratic revolution and all that, you know? Oh, uh, you're trying to create the Filipino identity and all that. Me, it's so easy. I just take them up a helicopter. I bring them at the highest point that the helicopter can go and drop them down on the mountains. I'm the better dictator. You, you're trying to be a, to be a statesman, trying to have show off your beautiful wife with all her, you know, beautiful things. Me, no, just go straight to the kill. 
But then when you're looking at this, you're trying to adapt things that you see from the Museum of Memory of Chile. You're looking at the museum, our Museum of Memory of Martial Law, you know, um, uh, the, the, the narrations of torture of Bonnie Ilagan, you know, and other political prisoners, your own experiences in rallies getting hit, you know, the things that you would do during that time in the time of free martial law, trying to create, you know, uh, how Jesus Christ would transform into different forms and how does this get to do, you know, with two Latin American countries facing that wound. So then you're trying to translate that, his, this, that historical text into a, a, a dramatic text. So it's not just literary texts that you look at. You're looking at other things as well. You're looking at photographs. You're looking at films. You're looking at paintings of the period. I'm looking at the, at the faces of Dolores Feria. You remember the paintings of Dolores Feria? of masks that she painted in the prison, painful masks. I'm trying to recall them because I don't know where they are. I've been asking the daughters, please, where they are, you know. But I'm trying to look at like what were happening in the streets, trying to remember so that we can memorialize. E eventually, when we're looking at what we want to do and what we want to translate, there is again the choice, what do we memorialize? in these times of forget. And I feel that the responsibility now of transferring texts is to make us remember because we have forgotten so much. Thank you. So easy to forget also with so many distractions surrounding us. So much information coming from everywhere. And we lies. Cannot, we cannot encourage. Lies. We cannot encourage the forgetfulness. Eh? Yeah. yeah. It's it's become our our responsibility. I mean, especially now. Okay, even as I decry in a masyadong emphasis at devices and gadgets, but <laughs> I mean, you know, it's so easy to Google this and Google that and find oh, out. Yeah. I mean, you know, and if you really are well read, you know the difference between fake news and real news. I mean. I don't excuse more for saying that you don't know. I don't excuse more na ano no sorry kasi ang inabot ko lang sa pagbabasa Pepe and Pilar hello. There's there's no excuse. And even tayo ako as as a housewife um outside of my of my work with the concerned artists of the Philippines. Mm -hmm. I haven't given up um, putting together my house staff and explaining to them kung sino ang mga choices ng iboboto, bakit mm -hmm. ito ang dapat iboboto. Because I am so reliant also on the fact that they have, they have their own little spheres of influences sa mga probinsya nila. Kasama yun sa responsibility. Uh, we, I, I cannot just, I mean, I mean you know, ang OC ko eh. Even when I'm texting to the, let's say, to the driver, I make sure correct yung spelling ng text ko. Mm -hmm. Para naman siya, pag nag-text siya sa anak niya, correct din ang spelling. Kasi pag kinatamaran mo, even the little things, tuloy-tuloy na yung katamara na yan. Samara, and then before you know it, it's also also already become second nature to you not to spell sila as C-L-A. <laughs> yung, yung mga ganyang bagay-bagay. Basta consistency at pakipag-usap. But in such a way that you don't make the man the people who work for you feel na. Eh kasi maralita lang kayo eh. Kaya hindi nyo alam ang mga katotoa. No, you don't talk to them. Kakausapin mo ang mga taong nagkatrabaho para sa'yo. Kakausapin mo sila bilang equals. Ipapaliwanag mo talaga. Tuloy-tuloy. At hanggang maging sa ano, maging sa pag-aaral. Ako, walang nangyari sa ano, no? Sa that experiment of mother tongue. Yeah. With the mother tongue box. It didn't quite fly, no? Yeah. <laughs> The K to twelve mother tongue based uh, education. 
kasi some of my friends in the in the US who had uh, mga lola binibili nila yung kanilang apo tinitingnan nila kung magbabait eh wala eh hindi rin hindi rin kumagat pero nakakahinayang yun kasi like like well um I grew up in Manila but because my mother was Waraya my father was Hiligay noon I I really tried to go back to the roots and and learn how to read and write in Waray because I'm feeling ko ganung Filipino eh ano na ako eh at my age nananampal na ako ng bata nagsasabing hindi po language ang Waray dialect lang yon hello so uh kasi tuloy-tuloy lang yung 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 sa translation it's actually every step along the way consistency and you know just don't take anything for granted also i'm thinking uh, when uh, when now when you're trans- when we look at translations and adaptations let's say not only of dramatic texts i'm looking at literary texts being translated into mm-hmm. um, other forms like a film uh for instance uh in um um René Villanueva's, you know, children's books, there is this, uh, the, the myth of Meibuyen, you know, the mother pig who feeds the hungry children, you know, uh, in, who are here in this life. And she has many, many breasts. And, you know, and so there are like, you know, so of course I did that into a play, but then the transferring it into a film, how do that, how does that, you know, figure in the lives of street children? For instance, what is that idea of a of of a mother feeding in a in a in a world of of incest, you know, of, and children, street children, become street children because they they experience incest in slum areas, or when when they uh, when they are children who have to. They're not, they claim they're not prostitutes, but they're kalakals because they sell their body for extra metal or extra scrap metal from construction sites, you know, in order to buy rye, because, or when they fight like street warriors, you know. So you have to, we, we try, you translate that from, just from that image of a mother, what is that mother feeding in this life? So, you know, you begin to, you begin to create, you know, the, the, the end, so you start with the subject, then but you end with an object here. Mm. What is the object of that of that uh, of that giving that feeding? What kind of children are these? So you select, you know, then you start to select what what spaces you will go into in in, in the when you're choosing the characters in which you can construct. Uh, if you permit me to, to still come back to uh, the last second half of the question, uh, if only because I also do think about this particular session as a moment uh, to be archived. It's rare to hear from all three of you in one panel. Right? And I think uh, it's, a, it's an important question to answer also for, especially for, I think, and the students in the audience. Um, so how do you handle questions of authenticity and comparison that haunt adaptations? So you've spoken at length about your ad- processes of adaptation and translation. Um, how do you navigate these questions of authenticity, I suppose, having to do with the fidelity to the original work, you know, questions like that? Um, although I would honestly uh, compound the question maybe and, and broaden it further to, to ask you know, uh, maybe what values would you, do you bear in mind when you translate or embody a work from May I say something? Yes. Well, it depends on what your intention is. Translation always depends on the intent and spirit. That is a basis of translation, intent and spirit. Um, do you intend to translate the work as it is? For instance, um, when you say uh, evening, I mean, or time between five and six, do you, will you say dusk? Will you say twilight? How do you say that in, in, in Filipino? Are you going to create a phrase? Or are you going to, to, to translate it in the word that's found in Filipino? You know, and, and it's um, sometimes it's not, 
it's not the word anymore. It's the spirit that tries to come out. I, I wonder, like for instance, there's a beautiful song of Michel Legrand, which Rolando Tino uh, translated. And it's like, and here it's like, um, summer me, winter me, and with your kisses shower me tenderly. We don't have a summer me, winter. We do not have summer nor winter, yeah? So Rolando transforms it into space. Iruko, iluko, at kumin sai sikatan mo arauko. You know, it's a different, it's a different feel of, of words, but with a spirit that still exists within that idea of the of the infinity or the or the space of love. Now there is also the deconstruction that is happening, right? There is also the interpretation. If you want to interpret, let's say a piece uh, uh, that was done in 1900 to be performed now during this time and space. If you find, let's say, kahapon ngayon at bukas of Aurelio Tolentino. And transform it from a piece during the American Filip Filipino American War yeah. into the into a piece of a work that is occurring right now in the conflict that is happening, let's say, in in Marawi. You know, and it's and it's going to be like certain questions you would have to deal with. Now, authenticity. I feel, I feel, okay, um, is the work of dire, of people who are interested in translations of texts into formal translations, mm -hmm. whereas of uh, the, uh, the, 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 the adaptations are more concerned with deconstructions, post-colonial interpretations, post-modern you know, interpretations, you know, or even just getting the essence of the work and basing a work and creating another work based on the essence of that work. It's, it's, it's like that. I think there are two different tracks. Thank you, Sir Anton. Um, Myra or Pibet, would you like to chime in? Um, I, I concur with um, Sir Anton because um, for me, authenticity is not really like fidelity to the work, but first you have to be authentic to yourself. You have to know, if you have an agenda, then be clear about it, your subject position. You have to be authentic to yourself and only then can you be authentic to the spirit of that work that you're adapting. Wonderful. Because that's it. That's it. If you're authentic to that spirit, it's, it's a good adaptation and you are true to the work that you're adapting. But if if there's nothing inside you and you're not you're just trying to fool around and not uh, digging deep down, authentic to yourself. Then, then, and then you're trying to be uh, loyal to that so-called loyal to that text, but no spirit. Then you actually did that original work disservice, right? Yeah. So authenticity for me is is yeah that no is the authenticity of your spirit, which will be in dialogue to that work. Yes, because authenticity for me is not like having a, a thesaurus right there beside you, translating kung tama yung pagkatranslate na salita into the language. Uh, for me, authenticity is yung pain material, yung sakit sa dibdib, yung pag-asa na nababanaag, yung, yun ang authentic para sa akin, hindi yung ano, Kailangan mo pag sinabi kong asul, blue, authentic na yun, hindi. So, I more or less concur with, with uh, Myra and with Anton there. Beautifully said. Um, it's almost, it is 6 o'clock p.m. in a bit. So, I do have to wrap up. But if you will permit the... Uh, Permit us one more, one last question, I suppose. And this is a little bit cheesy, but uh, I think important to, to address. Um, particular to this uh, panel, maybe we can just end on, on a question. Um, and it also kind of touches already on uh, a question that's also in the chat box. Um, so coming from your 
interdisciplinary practices, you know, as we say, um, how valuable do you think it is for English majors, for example, students of literature, to acquaint themselves also with other languages and expressions? The most stupid thing I've ever done as a UP student was not to recognize all the languages that were available there for me to study for free. I basically just took up French because you had to have a European language and then you passed it, but not to speak it. I took up Japanese and got content with Anatawana my one and deska. You know. But the thing is, talagang kailang it it's got to be more than that. The requirement of of uh, of a language is talagang ano eh. It's I have a friend na she's she's taking these this uh, courses on on the internet on Spanish blah 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 and then, then you know when she really started to get it, she used a book in Spanish. She was learning the language, the grammar, but yung emotion, yung pain, binabasa niya yung libro. And, and that's, because that's what, that's what makes a given work of art live. Eh? The explosion of the emotions, the feeling that it wakes up in, uh, in, in you and other people who read it. So, yun. I mean, I have a classic example. I always, when I always teach literature and theater and literature and the other arts. And I think Judy has passed also through that. Through that. I let them be. So when we're doing Lorca, when they read Lorca. I make them read Lorca, even if it's in English translated, as though they were reading it like a Spanish beat. Yeah. Because the beat is a pulse. And you say, what is a flamenco? And where does it come from? You know, it comes from the horse's hoofs. It comes from the beat. And it's historical because the horse is the conqueror of the entire world so that when Atechualpa said, when the most beautiful creature that runs on four feet, you know, that, that has four feet and runs on one, conquers our land, then our empire. Yes. And what is that all? What is the creature? The horse, because you know, that one leg is on the ground where all the other three are, you know, are, are up. And, and so when you say, Verde, verde, que te quiero verde, verdes vientos, verdes ojos, you know. So when you say green, green, I love you, green, you don't say green, green, I love you, green, green eyes, you know, it doesn't bring out the spirit of the poem. So we have green, green, even, even the way you say green is no longer going to be like American green, you know, speaking green like that. No, that's to be green, green, I love you, green, you know. It, you, you become you become so when they experience the literature, it's really more the experience of the language. It may not be Spanish, but it has a spirit of reading it in you know, language. And uh, it, Judy Ick played uh, Yerma beautifully, you know. And um, we were just talking about that yesterday in my class. You know, when you're looking at, at Yerma and you're looking at Yerma's desire, and that comes from under, you know. How is that similar to the desire that is very Western and Irish in the, in, in the dead? When Greta thinks of her hypothetical love, is there a relationship between the two? Of course there is a relationship. It's a desire bird. So even when the song is, is is a soft, you know, Irish song. There is that pulse inside of this woman that is, no, it is a, it is a pulse that is so unlike the falling snow. And that what, that's what makes it more painful, you know. So it's important to learn the beats of the language, you know, so that even like, like when I was studying, when I was studying French and I was studying French together with the time, I say, cet amour, si beau, si fragile, si tendre, c'est ce désespoir.
Spere. It's so different from the Italian translation. Questo amore, così violento, così tenero. You know, it's different. It's a different beat. Then you understand how that love is seen in the eyes of an Italian and seen in the eyes of a French. And then when you say, translate it into Filipino and you say, itong pag-ibig. Pagka sakit sakit kung minsan. Punung puno ng galak. Kung baga. You know, it's different. When, when you have that, you have the different beats and the different, then you understand what it's like, you know, in the different contexts. And I think that's what language is. Although we have a commonality, there is the difference, the new ones, you know, that it's totally cultural, okay? cultural based. And I think comparative literature students should be studying language. Otherwise, you know, they're studying comparative literature as translated in English. <laughs> Cannot be. They should at least have at least one language, or that they can read a language, you know, a work in another language. And you must be. They must be patient. Student, literature students really have a long time, you know, to go before they take their PhD because they have to study the language. Ganun yun. Kaya, well, ganun yun eh. That's why counting come. Paunti ng paunti nag-aaral ng English and comparative literature, you know. But then again, apparently, dumadami na naman. Oh, dumadami na naman in the in the in the surveys of the world. It went on a slump. Now it's going up again. Oh, kasi nakakalungkot na talaga. I mean, this is. I mean, What's a popular search engine? Na parang akala mo source of all font. Uh, all uh, the, the font of knowledge. Yahoo. Ba Google. Pero ano ang Yahoo talaga doon sa Gulliver Swift na ano na ano Jonathan Swift na tra- Gulliver's Travels. They're the ano, di ba? They're, they're the course yeah. uh the, the course uh yung, yung mga brutish creatures. But sino ang talagang sino ang talagang matalino? The Winims. Bakit hindi magamit ng winim.com? Sino ang makakaspell ng winim.com? <laughs> Kaya tiis-tiis na lang sa yahoo.com. Ang dami na ano eh. But, but we have to ano, we, we cannot give up. Kasi, I mean, you know, for each generation naman may, may bagong changes talaga, Anton. In the same manner, that our professors who were handling us when we were when we were starting ibang iba na rin yon sa panahon nila when mrs e had to go to japan to to be with sv and you know kanya kanyang kanya kanyang pinanggalingan niya so in the same manner that the people who who were there to teach us never gave up we shouldn't also we cannot we cannot afford to Myra. So when you ask the question about uh, language uh, as befits my my paper, um, what I said earlier, I really took it as learning the different language of um, image, sound, and movement. So yes, of course, because we, we live in such a world. Uh, and, 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 and I think if you learn those, if you have these multiplicities, then you are a, a person who is not so one-track minded and, and narrow in, in your perception of things. You you understand, you have more empathy also if you if you know all these different registers of, of meaning. Yeah. But yeah, in terms of uh, another like let's say language uh, to learn and, and like Bibeth, I I I pass my English language exam in CL by watching Almadavar and all the others, the subtitles. That's how I learned. I was trying to get all those courses. I couldn't because I, you know, I, I didn't, it was just memory work for me. But when I saw the image uh, and the text, then yeah, th- that's how it all clicked. Yeah, so that's it. That's my answer. Yes, we live in a 
multimedia world. We we have to know all the languages uh, that are available out there. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of our panelists. As much as uh, we would love to continue talking and talking, um, I do have to synthesize. Let me do my best to synthesize um, the wonderful ways that this conversation has turned uh, in the course of this afternoon. It feels so short, um, but on the subject of finding, because that is our theme not to find, I think uh, this discussion has really uh, taught us so many different ways uh, of, of uh, approaching literature and uh, taking literature uh, to so many different uh, pathways, um, not just where, but also how. Um, in the course of the discussion, there were so many, and let me just like, uh, it is so poetic. Uh, there were so many, so many resonances of ideas of place, time, uh, location, uh, we talked a lot about intersections, about graphing and mapping, about locating and discovering. Uh, there was so much motion and there was so much movement. Uh, we talked about uh, studies as exercise, right? not just a form, but practice, uh, not just a finished product, but process. And uh, many different journeys that are in the end ultimately um, transformative. And I think this is something that in, to which you know, all of the ideas really dovetail, right? The idea of transforming, evolving, and in the course of that also resisting the ways that we are taught to behave, the ways that we are taught to stay the same, the ways that we are taught to you know, maintain a certain status quo and so on. And so um, this barely does justice not to the ways that this uh, conversation has taken us to uh, the different uh, ways of making meaning, um, different ways of uh, creating meaning and rediscovering meaning. Um, but I hope um, in, the process, in the ways that it has also kind of in embedded in us, um, ideas of openness, um, at, while at the same time maintaining rootedness, you know, frames of action, ethical core and values. Um, I hope that it has opened up to everyone listening here and who will listen perhaps in the future to this archived conversation, um, new possibilities for literary studies and of course, uh, new futures uh, of practice and intellectual ferment and Certainly, why not? No? Uh, new futures for the department as well. So many thanks uh, to all of our panelists. I learned so much um, from all of you.